I need to tell you about this amazing little toad. It's an amphibian that we nearly drove to extinction. We did in the wild, but we have now successfully reintroduced it and began saving this species. This is the Kasani spray toad. They are native or endemic to the base of the Kasani River waterfall in Tanzania. That habitat which is covered by the spray of the waterfall, is only about two hectares. Well, that's just enough that you could barely cover four football fields. Like, that's a tiny micro habitat that these guys are endemic to. It's actually the smallest known range of any terrestrial vertebrate. With such a small range, of course, it means the amphibian, the toad itself, is very small. Males typically are larger than females, and those males only get to be about the size of a quarter. It, 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 that's tiny. That's nothing. If that didn't make this little toad amazing enough, they give live birth. Yeah, that means no little tadpoles, no swimming down to water and laying eggs, these toads give birth to miniature versions of themselves. Like, and if the full-grown adults are the size of quarters, look how tiny the babies are. It, it's amazing. I really hope you are all as excited about this amphibian as I am. Seriously, this guy, this little amphibian, lives in an area a quarter of the size of this floor space of Buckingham Palace gives live birth and is smaller than a quarter. And they're just, they're just out there. We, they've only been discovered in the last 30 years. It was actually only about 1996 that they were first discovered. Unfortunately, at that time, their future already looked very bleak. It's because in 1994, the government of Tanzania approved a, a, a dam, a hydroelectric dam, for the Kasani River. It's very important to the local economy, provides lots of electricity, however, it reduced the overall water flow by almost 90%, leaving less than 10% of the original water flow, reducing the overall spray, reducing that microhabitat to a very tiny, basically unlivable size. What makes matters even worse is shortly after that happened, a fungus ravaged the remaining population. And at this point is when they were actually declared extinct in the wild. Thankfully, in 2001, the Bronx Zoo, along with a few others, started a captive breeding program. They did this in hopes of saving a species. Well, and they did. The unique habitat requirements, however, proved very difficult to replicate, so it took them almost three years to get it right. Then in late 2004, they really began to see real success. They shared this technique, the Bronx Zoo, with Toledo, with Detroit, and really began successfully breeding them in multiple locations. The Toledo Zoo, in fact, now has thousands of individuals, most of which are who aren't on display, that are alive and thriving. They work successfully with the Bronx, the Detroit Zoos, like I said, but also with the Henry Dorley Zoo. So, there, in, so we've got places basically all across the country that are working in conjunction with con local conservation groups in Tanzania to save this species. But if you remember, because of the dam, essentially 90% of the original habitat was destroyed or lost. So they set up a sprinkler system, and they had tried this in the past, but it was now perfected due to the, the practice that they had in breeding them in captivity. We're able to install a sprinkler system that mimicked the original spray, replaced the lost habitat, and we have, starting in 2010, began to reintroduce them into the wild. They started in 2010 with about 100 individuals and now, out of last count, which was in 2021, there was over 6,000 individuals in that, in that native microhabitat. 
it's estimated that in that area, a healthy population before, you know, human involvement would be about 17,000 individuals. So if you think about it, to go from essentially none in the wild to recovering 35% of the original population in less than 12 years is amazing. You hear about species dying and losing them all the time. And yes, that is a big deal and we shouldn't lose focus on that, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't celebrate when we succeed. And at this rate, as long as the conservation continues, this species could easily reach original levels. And you don't really hear about that often. Have you ever wondered why coins have ridges? Just like so many everyday objects, there's actually so much more detail behind it than you'd think. Coin clipping was an empire-spanning issue until very recently, because for centuries, coins were made out of gold and silver. It was a process where certain wily individuals would cut little tiny pieces off of the corners and edges of all of the coins and then go and spend the coin at face value. Eventually you have enough shavings and clippings to melt down and sell for profit. With this example, you can see, you know, from a regular coin and just how it progresses through the clipping process and how much smaller the coin really gets. We're talking a 35 or 40 percent loss of the overall mass of the coin. And this inconsistency just led to even more counterfeiting issues. This is where the ridges come in. And it's yet one more thing we can attribute to Isaac Newton. He was made warden of the British Royal Mint in 1696. He then oversaw the recoinage of the British Empire and by 1698, all circulating British currency had been taken in and reissued. And now they were precisely weighed coins with milled edges. So the second anyone tried to tamper with it, it was easy for anyone around them or anyone getting the coin in a transaction to tell if the coin had been altered. So this was one of the first major steps towards a stable currency. And this is all just the little ridges that are around, you know, U.S. quarters and dimes are around other currencies as well. But when you think about a U.S. quarter, the ridges always stand out. It's amazing just how much detail is behind everyday objects that most of us don't think twice about. Your brain doesn't work the way you think it does. Most people consider themselves to be rational individuals who can take in the details of a situation and form a conclusion. They can then communicate that conclusion to people around them. This is something that everyone is totally capable of, but what if I told you that for the most part, this isn't our go-to thought process. Our go-to thought process is something that happens much more on autopilot. When you detect the tone in someone's voice, when you flinch back from pain, the fact that you can't help but understanding the words on a giant billboard as you're driving down the road. These are things that you don't really have conscious control over. This is called System 1. System 1 usually works just fine for us on a day-to-day -day basis to keep us alive. It's usually only when presented with info that contradicts the conclusion System 1 makes that System 2 our critical thinking skill comes into play. The problem is, if we aren't careful, this overlap can lead us to false conclusions. I've got a few word problems. Some of you may be familiar with them to help explain what I mean. The first one, it takes 10 printers, 10 minutes to produce 10 booklets. If you have 35 printers, printing 35 booklets, how many minutes does it take? I bet, like most people, your initial answer was 35. 35 minutes. That's not correct. The correct answer is 10 minutes. As long as the amount of printers and the amount of booklets remains the same, the amount of time required doesn't change. Number two. There's a pond 
that is slowly being covered by lily pads. Every day, the amount of lily pads on the lake doubles. On the first day there's one, on the second day there's two, on the third day there's four, on the fifth day there's eight, so on and so forth. On the 30th day, the pond is completely covered with lily pads. How many days did it take for half of the pond to be covered? I bet you a lot of you said 15. The correct answer is 29. On the 29th day, the pond was half covered. Working backwards from the full pond, you only have to have the full pond once in order to get to a half covered pond. Therefore, it's 29 days. And lastly, a phone and a phone case together cost $110. The phone cost $100 more than the case. How much was the case? I bet like a lot of people, you said 10 bucks. But if that was true, and the phone was $100 more than the case, that would make the phone cost $110. So combined, it would be $120. The correct answer is five. The case only cost $5. And if the phone is $100 more, that makes the phone cost $105. So together, you're at 110 bucks. The economist Shane Frederick administered these questions, granted with slightly different variables, to thousands of university students. Five in six got at least one wrong, and one in three got them all wrong. Even being really good at math didn't guarantee success. The students who were studying math specifically only did slightly better than average. Yet as soon as you explain the answer out loud, you see the little light bulb go off, and all you can think about is, well, how did I not see that before? even in your day-to-day -day life. Have you ever been convinced that someone was mad at you, something you did made them so angry they're never going to talk to you ever again? Come to find out that wasn't true at all, that that person hadn't thought about that interaction again and you had essentially made it all up? I know what's happened to me. So a fairly simple word problems or your basic day-to-day -day social interaction can lead us to false conclusions just imagine how easy it would be to get to those false conclusions with how complex our society is today, with how much information is coming at you all the time. This thought process obviously has its flaws, but keep in mind, this is what gave us the ability to go from harnessing fire to exploring the stars. It is our greatest evolutionary advantage. But if we're aware of the inherent flaws in the process, we can stop ourselves from getting to those false conclusions or at least prevent them from happening so quickly or so often. So don't run on autopilot. Always be critical of your surroundings. And remember, you have to use your greatest evolutionary advantage. And if you do that, our potential is limitless. The idea and information for today's show came from two excellent books, Rationality by Steven Pinker and Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. We only just barely scratched the surface on the plethora of information included in these books. So if you found this topic interesting, you should definitely go check them out. If you enjoyed this. What lives in a hive? Bees, wasps, ants, maybe termites. You may have even thought of the naked mole rat. Technically, that's more of a colony than a hive, but same idea. Well, I have another hive dweller that probably never crossed your mind because they live underwater. Meet the bees of the sea. This particular species is Synalpheus regalis, one of only seven species that exhibit this eusocial behavior. Out of over 1,100 species of snapping shrimp, snapping shrimp are always easily distinguished because they have asymmetric claws, one's bigger than the other. 
No varieties of snapping shrimp get very big. However, our hive-dwelling varieties top out at about an eighth of an inch in length. That's the same size as the height of two quarters stacked on top of each other. So these guys are tiny. This minuscule size allows them to inhabit a very unique microhabitat. Unlike the terrestrial animals who usually build their homes, these snapping shrimp have formed a mutually beneficial symbiotic relationship with certain species of sea sponges. The shrimp protects the sponge from predators and parasites, and the sponge provides food and shelter for the shrimp. Both benefit, but neither could live without the other. This is called obligate mutualism. All of these factors and more are why they were only discovered 25 years ago on the Belize Barrier Reef. As we continue to explore the remote and secluded parts of our planet, we find more cryptofauna living in places even stranger than the inside of a sea sponge. The... When was the last time you heard anyone say anything nice about airports or air travel in general? The closest I can remember boils down to it wasn't as terrible as they were expecting. And I'm not really sure that you can call that a compliment. It's usually a list of complaints. Long lines, extra delays, severe restrictions, the expensive everything. You know how it goes. It's hard to argue that modern air travel can be extremely frustrating. But when was the last time you really thought about how incredible flying really is? You are willingly paying someone to pack you into a metal tube that sealed just well enough to hold in just enough air to keep you breathing. This glorified tin can is then launched off the ground to 30,000 feet, moving at just shy the speed of sound. Of course, it's not usually described so dramatically, but has it become so commonplace that instead of being at least a little amazed at the whole process, we complain about the drinks. Before I continue, I've not been doing this long, but so far I really enjoy sharing all of this knowledge with you. If you've enjoyed watching, please take a second and like this video, subscribe to the channel, and enable notifications, that way you never miss anything new. It only takes a moment for you, but it can make a big difference for me. Onwards! Just over 150 years ago, before the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad, if you wanted to travel coast to coast in the U.S., you were looking at a multi-month ordeal, mostly along the Oregon Trail. The completion of the railroad cut that multi-month journey down to about a week. Even today, a cannonball run, which is an unsanctioned speed record that runs from New York to LA, currently sits at 25 hours and 39 minutes. That requires a highly illegal average speed of 110 miles an hour. The cannonball run actually started as a protest in the 70s against newly instated strict speed limits. But that story deserves a video all on its own. I've actually made a similar drive from Michigan to Oregon, and even rotating drivers and minimal stops, it took us over 40 hours to get there. We always maintain the legal speed limit. We do! Anywho... Today, in your standard 747 passenger airliner, a coast-to-coast -coast journey across the U.S. only takes about six hours. By stagecoach along the Oregon Trail, 
that would have been 1,440 hours. Flying sounds better. Now, this is by no means the limit of our technology. Passenger airliners don't go faster because, among other reasons, sonic booms over populated areas don't tend to go over very well. Currently, the fastest jet is the SR-71 Blackbird. It was first put into military service in January 1966. It has a listed cruising speed of Mach 3.2, or 2,455 miles per hour, which means a coast-to-coast -coast flight in just under an hour. Our next big step will make even the Blackbird look slow. Suborbital flight is estimated to be able to take you from New York to Shanghai, so halfway around the world, in 40 minutes. 40 minutes. That's less time than the average American spends commuting back and forth to work every day. Any faster, and we might as well be teleporting. So, next time someone you know starts to complain about flying, instead of joining in, stop and try to get them to appreciate just how spectacular flying really is. The Hi, I'm William, your fountain of random knowledge. Today, I have five natural phenomena so strange that you have to see them to believe. First, these otherworldly lights aren't supernatural or alien in nature. However, their rarity has caused more than one 911 call. In polar regions, when the atmosphere is particularly cold, ice crystals can form into flat hexagonal shapes. When this occurs over artificial light sources, those crystals act as mirrors and bounce the light between them, causing the pillars of light to form. In even rarer circumstances, this same phenomena can happen at sunrise or sunset, creating sun pillars. However, due to the time of day and the amount of light at the time, those are much harder to see. Before I continue, I've not been doing this long, but so far I really enjoy sharing all of this knowledge with you. If you've enjoyed watching, please take a second and like this video, subscribe to the channel, and enable notifications, that way you never miss anything new. It only takes a moment for you, but it can make a big difference for me. Onwards! Blood falls on the Taylor Glacier in Antarctica looks as if it could be flowing directly out of the seventh circle of hell. While it may seem infernal at first, I promise there is a perfectly reasonable explanation. When first discovered in 1911 by Thomas Griff Taylor and his crew, they theorized it could be caused by a red algal growth. It wasn't until the 1960s that we discovered it was caused by iron salts or ferric hydroxide leaking out from under the ice sheet. More recent findings elaborate that it originates from a hypersaline lake that's been trapped under the glacier for well over a million years. Unique chemosynthetic bacteria were also found in the brine solution which points to a large subglacial ecosystem. If true, it could illuminate the conditions that we may find life in on other worlds. The big remaining question is what force is pushing the solution to the surface? It's clearly immense, but its source is unknown. The deepest parts of the Amazon jungle have always been shrouded in myth and legend. Most myths have at least some basis in reality. Well, it turns out, as we learn more about the jungle, 
some of these myths weren't just based in reality. They are a reality. The Boiling River, or Shanae Tipishika, as it's known to the locals, which translates to boiled by the heat of the sun. It's been known by the indigenous people for generations. But it wasn't until they introduced geophysicist Andres Rousseau to the river that it became accepted by the outside world. This happened in 2011, and he's been studying it ever since. Over a stretch of over six kilometers, or almost four miles, at the width of a two-lane road, it maintains a temperature of 86 degrees Celsius, or 186.8 degrees Fahrenheit, which is more than enough to kill anything that falls in it. Geothermal hot springs aren't exactly uncommon. They can be found all across the world. Usually, you find them near some kind of volcanic activity. Unlike other examples, the Boiling River is significantly larger. But even stranger is that the nearest area of volcanic activity is over 700 kilometers away or 435 miles. Chemical analysis of the water shows it to be meteoric, which means it once fell as rain. This fact, combined with its isolation from volcanic activity, point to an immense hydrothermal system existing underneath the Amazon, where the Catatumbo River meets Lake Maracaibo exists a storm so intense it puts even a Roshar high storm to shame. The unique geography and climate conditions cause an extreme static buildup, which causes lightning storms so intense and so frequent they've been given their own name. Catatumbo's lightning, or the beacon of Maracaibo. Storms occur here almost 300 nights a year, with an average of 28 lightning strikes per minute over a 7 to 10 hour period. For comparison, Orange Tree, Florida, the U.S. leader in lightning strikes, experiences 79 strikes per square kilometer. The beacon of Maracaibo receives over 250 strikes per square kilometer. That adds up to over 1.6 million lightning strikes per year happening in this small area. At times, the lightning is so constant, you can see the landscape around you as if it were daylight. Lastly, on the Indonesian island of Java, stretching over 22 kilometers, is the Kua Ijin Volcano Complex. In the light of day, it looks much like you would expect from any volcano. Yet, once night falls, the gates of Hades open wide. As the rock liquefies, it releases the large amounts of trapped sulfur. This sulfur, on exposure to oxygen, is ignited by the lava, and then the sulfur burns with an electric blue flame. The lava itself isn't blue. It's just coated with a layer of burning sulfur. As breathtaking as it may be, it's also incredibly dangerous. When sulfur burns, it releases sulfur dioxide, which is extremely toxic. If that wasn't enough, the high sulfur concentration has caused the associated crater lake to have a pH just above zero. It's essentially a lake full of sulfuric acid, not somewhere 
you ever want to go swimming. These were only a few of the mind-boggling natural phenomena spread across this amazing world of ours. There is still so much to see. Greetings and welcome. Conventional wisdom says that all of the major discoveries worth discovering have been discovered outside the deep ocean. This isn't even a newly developed idea or opinion. Famous naturalist and anatomist Georges Cuvier discounted the likelihood of finding any new large quadruped species back in 1812. The most recent large quadruped discovered was in 1992. That's 180 years later. This discovery brought the number of large quadrupeds discovered since Cuvier's dictum to 335. Currently, scientists have classified about 1.9 million plant and animal species. Yet, estimates for the total number of species across the globe is upwards of 50 million. If accurate, this means we've only discovered about 5% of the plant and animal species that are on the planet today. There is still so much to discover. Here's 10 of the rarest and most mysterious animals we've discovered so far. The Saiga antelope, or Saiga tatarica. Their bulbous noses are reminiscent of something right out of Star Wars. Yet, they are from right here on this planet. They were originally endemic to almost all of Eurasia, but are currently restricted to a small part in the southwest of Asia and a little bit of Europe. They average about the size of a Great Dane. That amazing proboscis-like nose is thought to provide many benefits to its owner. One, warming the frigid winter air. Two, filtering dust from the dry summer air. And three, amplifying their mating calls. Currently, they are threatened by a trifecta of problems. Habitat loss, poaching, and disease. Thankfully, multiple organizations worldwide are working to change all that. Before I continue, I've not been doing this long, but so far I really enjoy sharing all of this knowledge with you. If you've enjoyed watching, please take a second like this video, subscribe to the channel, and enable notifications, that way you never miss anything new. It only takes a moment for you, but it can make a big difference for me. Onwards! The Pink Fairy Armadillo, Clamifortis truncatus. No larger than a dollar bill, these tiny, nocturnal creatures are native to central Argentina. They spend the majority of their time underground, so instead of protection, their shell is full of blood vessels to help facilitate thermal regulation. Not only are they elusive, but they don't survive well in captivity, so our knowledge about them is very limited. In fact, one biologist spent almost a decade in the field studying them and never managed to see one in person. They are currently listed as endangered and conservation efforts are ongoing. However, our serious lack of knowledge makes that tricky. The Honduran White Bat or the Caribbean White Tent-Making Bat Ectophila Alba. Out of over 1,300 known species of bat, there are only six that have any white fur, and this is the only species with only white fur. 
Surprisingly enough, this white fur acts as excellent camouflage. During the day, as they roost in their tents, it makes them all but invisible. They make these tents by strategically cutting the ribs on the leaves of the helicona plant. They also seem to maintain multiple tents throughout their range. Observations show it feeding exclusively on the fruit from a single species of fig tree. It's assumed that they supplement this somehow in order to maintain proper nutrition, but how is currently unknown. Another standout feature of these bats is their yellow skin. The yellow color is because of a high concentration of carotenoids in their skin. That carotenoid's unique composition is currently being studied to help treat macular degeneration. As a bonus, this has caused increased funding to help protect them. The babirusa, or deer pig. Babirusus celebensis. A member of the wild pig family. However, they do differ significantly from your standard pig. The most obvious is their magnificent tusks. The upper pair grows so large they actually curl around and pierce through the roof of the mouth out the top of the skull and continue growing. It doesn't seem to cause the animal any pain or distress. What may be the largest difference is actually their two-chambered stomach system. It's much closer to what you would find in a sheep than what you find in a pig. This would normally make them herbivorous, like sheep and goats and things like that. However, Bobby Rusas are absolutely omnivorous, which leaves their classification as a matter of debate. Current numbers across all species are estimated to be less than 10,000, with conservation efforts ongoing. The lowland streaked tenric, hemicentesis semispinosis. Another tiny entry on our list, these mini pincushions are less than six inches long and weigh a maximum of about half a pound. Although similar in many ways, Two hedgehogs, they share very little genetic relation. Their closest genetic relatives are actually elephants and aardvarks, native to the lowland tropical rainforest of Madagascar. They live in large complex burrows with family units of up to 20 members. What makes these incredibly unique is they actually use stridulation for part of their communication. Stridulation is the act of producing sound by rubbing two body parts together, just like crickets. In this case, they use spines. They are the only mammal that has ever been recorded using this method of communication. The rusty spotted cat. Prionolaris rubiginosus, the world's smallest wildcat. It grows to a maximum of eight inches tall, two and a half feet long, that's with tail, and weigh at a maximum of about three and a half pounds. For comparison, your average domestic house cat weighs about eight pounds. They live mostly in Sri Lanka but have also been witnessed in both India and Nepal. These guys are mostly nocturnal, tiny, and right at home in the dense forest. This makes learning about them very hard, which in turn makes conservation efforts very hard. The chevrotain, or mouse deer. Tregulus. Javicus. It may look like both, but in fact is a member 
of its own unique group of hoofed animals. Like many members on our list, these animals are unbelievably small. The mouse deer only weigh about four pounds, or roughly the size of a large rabbit. They are completely herbivorous, so their large, almost out-of-place fangs are only used to compete for mates and territory. They make their home in Southeast Asia, and like so many others in that area, their largest threat is habitat loss. Vampire deer. It sounds like the name of a cheesy horror movie. We don't actually call them vampire deer, but they're real. The water deer, Hydropodus inermis. They are native to parts of Vietnam and China. Smaller than they look, they top out at around 30 pounds. What makes them the perfect cheesy movie villain is how much control they have over their fangs. They're loosely mounted in the sockets, and they have special facial muscles so they can point the fangs whichever direction they want. They can point them forward in aggression when competing for mates and territory, and they can actually fold them back when it comes to grazing. The okapi, forest giraffe, Congolese giraffe, zebra giraffe, or a copy Johnstoni, standing around five feet tall, eight feet long, and around 800 pounds. These giraffe cousins are right at home in the forests of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. They look like such a perfect zebra giraffe hybrid that even after multiple accounts and stories, it wasn't until 1901 they were actually accepted as a real species. Thankfully enough, an increase in recent public awareness has also increased conservation efforts. The last entry on our list today is the rarest large land mammal on the planet. With potentially less than a thousand individuals remaining. Roughly three feet tall, five feet long, and about 200 pounds, it was only discovered in 1992 when an odd skull was found in the home of a local hunter. This is the saula, the spindle horn, the Asian unicorn, the vuquang ox, or Sudorix in Gedenhansis, native to the Annamite forest, which runs down the border between Vietnam and Laos. While very similar in appearance to a goat, they actually belong to their own unique species. For years, there have been local stories, and more recently, we have found remains and captured images on trail camps. But to this day, a biologist has never seen one in the wild. Their extreme rarity and our utter lack of understanding, just like other entries today, makes conservation efforts incredibly difficult. Thankfully enough, there are a few groups that are committed to saving the Saula regardless of the difficulties. Science and discovery are all about being open-minded. You should never run into an idea or concept that completely derails your ability to think and reason. Never 100% dismiss a reasonable idea, reasonable idea, without clear evidence. This is why Bigfoot is one of my favorite talking points, especially with people who immediately dismiss the possibility. The continental United States has over 89,000 square miles or 230,000 square kilometers of officially protected wilderness. If you include Alaska, that's 174,000 square miles or 450,000 square kilometers. 
The region the Saula was discovered in only covers 36,000 square miles, or 94,000 square kilometers. While I agree the likelihood of a human-sized primate existing today without clear evidence in the world's third most populated country is incredibly low. Yet that doesn't mean there isn't still tons of stuff out there to discover. And I think, if anything, today's animals prove that. You won't believe this piece of random knowledge. There are more trees on planet Earth than there are stars in the Milky Way galaxy. The scientific journal Nature published an article in 2015 titled Mapping Tree Density at a Global Scale. Scientists used 428,775 actual field measurements from all over the world to estimate a global tree population at 3.04 trillion. According to NASA, the most recent estimates put the number of stars in the Milky Way galaxy somewhere between 100 and 400 billion. Now both figures are extremely difficult to estimate, and they're impossible to verify, but given their vast differences, I'd say it's safe to say there are more trees than there are stars. Imagine a burning world close to its star, with heavy clouds of metal floating aloft, raining down titanium droplets. This is how James Jenkins, the co-author of a recent article in Astronomy and Astrophysics, described the discovery. Before we continue, I have a small favor to ask. Please take a second, like this video, subscribe to the channel, and enable notifications. That way, you'll never miss anything new. It only takes a second for you, but it makes a big difference for me. Together, there is still so much to learn and discover. Onwards! First discovered in 2020 by TESS, T-E-S-S, -S, the Transitioning Exoplanet Survey Satellite. TESS looks for drops in visible light as exoplanets cross in front of their stars. This data gives us a rough idea of the size of the planet and the planet's orbit. So far, using this method, over 4,000 exoplanets have been discovered and tagged for further study. There are many methods for this additional study, including CHEOPS, C-H-E-O-P-S, the Characterizing Exoplanet Satellite. CHEOPS uses a very similar method to tests but spends significantly more time observing each subject to gain a much more detailed picture. When this data is combined with additional observation methods and some eye-crossing math, we get a surprisingly detailed picture of the exoplanet. Located 262 light years from here, the drably designated LTT 9779b is a Neptune-sized exoplanet orbiting a G-type star, much like our Sun. This orbit only takes an inconceivable 19 hours. That puts it 60 times closer to its star than Earth. It's tidally locked, which means it doesn't spin, and it maintains an average surface temperature of 3,300 degrees Fahrenheit, or 1,800 degrees Celsius, which is hotter than lava. What makes this planet extraordinary is its proximity to its star should both prevent it from having an atmosphere and make it substantially hotter. But it doesn't, and it isn't. Evidence points to an atmosphere full of metals and silicates with a rain of liquid titanium. Its extreme density prevents it from being 
blown away by solar activity, and its metal content acts as a giant mirror reflecting 80% of the incoming light. This severely limits the heat it receives from its star. For comparison, the Earth only reflects about 35% of the incoming light. This gigantic space mirror is one of the latest mind-boggling celestial objects that we plan to use the James Webb Space Telescope, as well as the currently being constructed extremely large telescope to learn more about. What's been discovered so far is almost beyond imagination. So I can't wait to see what we discover next. The one Nature is full of some astounding similarities. I've got a really cool one for you today. Almost all mammals, regardless of size, have roughly the same number of heartbeats, give or take one billion. I'll compare a rabbit to an elephant to show you. A domestic rabbit has an average resting heart rate of 160 beats per minute and lives on average about 12 years. Let's do the math. 160 beats per minute times 60 minutes per hour times 24 hours per day times 365 days per year times 12 years for the lifespan. The units all cancel out, leaving you with 1,009,152,000 heartbeats in their lifetime. In contrast, an African elephant has a resting heart rate of about 30 beats per minute and lives an average of about 70 years. Here's the math. 30 beats per minute times 60 minutes per hour times 24 hours per day times 365 days per year times 70 years in one lifespan. The units all cancel, leaving you with 1,103,760,000 beats in its lifetime. It's such a constant that it's been found based on size, you can actually calculate both their heart rate and their lifespan. Nature is so cool. An epic adventure of human power. If you turn on the news for more than five minutes today, it's easy to fall victim to the sensationalized, rating-seeking news stories of doom and gloom and conclude everything is awful. This style of news causes us to miss so many of the inspirational and uplifting stories that we desperately need to hear. I'm going to share one with you today and hopefully restore a little bit of your faith in humanity. Jason Lewis and Steve Smith, a pair of old college friends who had become increasingly frustrated with the monotony of modern life. It was while flipping through the Guinness Book of World Records that they found the adventure they didn't know they needed. They noticed that nobody had ever completed a human-powered circumnavigation of the globe. They decided to change that. After nearly two years of fundraising and preparation, the pair set off from Greenwich, England on July 13th, 1994 for their epic adventure. In Lagos, Portugal, they met up with Moksha, their custom purpose-built paddle boat. Yes, paddle boat. Moksha is a Hindu idea for the end of the cycle of death and rebirth, a very fitting name for their noble craft. They couldn't even begin to imagine the hardship that lay in front of them. So undaunted, they climbed aboard their paddle boat and headed west across the Atlantic. Pedaling constantly in shifts, it took the pair 111 days to make it all the way across the Atlantic Ocean, almost 5,000 miles to Miami. Apparently, this journey wasn't difficult enough for Jason, because while recovering in Miami, he made the decision that he would traverse the US on rollerblades, despite the fact he had zero skating experience whatsoever. Now, Steve would stick with his bike, and of course, a bike and rollerblades have a very different pace. Because of this, the pair split with plans to meet back up in San Francisco 
to tackle the Pacific Ocean together. It took Jason many days and many scrapes, bumps, and bruises, but he figured it out and made his way westward across the U.S. After 2,000 miles just outside of Pueblo, Colorado, only a few minutes from the rare treat he set up for himself, a hot shower and a warm bed, that everything went black. He awoke, every part of his body in pain, covered in bandages, in what he shortly would learn to be the hospital. He was then informed that he had been struck from behind by a drunk driver. If it hadn't been for the specific placement of the cooking pot in his backpack that acted as a cushion, he would have also broken his spine and likely been paralyzed. Thankfully, it was in the right position, protected his spine, so he only ended up with two broken legs. Regardless, Jason wasn't gonna let a little thing like broken bones stand in his way. So lo and behold, less than nine months later, he strapped his skates back on and continued his journey west. Steve, having been nothing but supportive for his entire recovery, met him in San Francisco as planned with the Pacific Ocean laid out in front of them. It can be argued that this first leg of the Pacific Ocean was the most dangerous part of the journey. Their first attempt actually ended up with Moksha capsized and they required rescue from the Coast Guard. Thankfully, they were able to try again and it was on this second attempt in 74 days that they made it to Hawaii. At this point, it's September of 1998, over four years since they initially set out. Well, in that time, Steve's plan for life had changed. The biggest change was Steve planned to be married to someone he actually met on the first leg of their journey between Greenwich and Lagos. So on good terms, Steve left the expedition, leaving Jason to finish alone. What he did next, by all rights, should have been impossible. But Jason did it anyway, suffering dehydration, malnutrition, blood poisoning, severe exhaustion, and on the edge of sanity, Jason completed the 3,500 mile journey from Hawaii to Tarawa, an island in the Pacific, by himself in a paddle boat through the doldrums, an area with a counter current. So there were many days that no matter how hard he pushed, all of his progress was lost the moment he went to sleep. He did it anyway, with perseverance, and a little luck, he made it all the way through. Now his recovery from this ordeal at sea did take quite a while, the better part of a year. But as soon as he could, he was back to it. Kayaking through the Solomon Islands and then bike packing across Australia, ending in the city of Darwin. Now it was in Darwin where he hit the proverbial wall. Unfortunately, real life reared its ugly head because the expedition was $106,000 in debt. Without other options, Jason was forced to put the trip on hold for almost five years while he pinched pennies and paid back everything that he could. But in all of that time, he never lost sight of his dream. Finally, in 2005, all of his debts paid, he packed his bags and continued his quest. It was in Singapore that his financial salvation finally arrived. The long sought after sponsorship. It wasn't gigantic. He wasn't going to be staying in five star hotels by any means, but he no longer had to sleep on the side of the road. More importantly, he could now focus on experiencing the adventure versus paying for the adventure. For his next leg, he traveled overland through China but was forced to travel mostly at night in order to avoid corrupt police checkpoints. Once past that, he continued through Tibet, through India to Mumbai. It was in Mumbai where he met Moksha for their final sea journey, 2,000 miles across the Arabian Sea, making landfall in Djibouti, north through Africa, and while in Sudan, Against the odds, he actually ran into fellow British world travelers, Ewan McGregor and Charlie Borman. 
The famous pair was traveling from John O'Groat, Scotland to Cape Town, South Africa on BMW motorcycles for their special long way down. Where are you up to? Well, I left England what, 13 years ago and uh, to do a circumnavigation using only human power. So crossing Atlantic from Portugal to Miami in the pedal boat and then crossing the US on rollerblades uh, across the Pacific to Australia on the pedal boat. Well, listen, yeah. good luck. It's yeah, a pleasure to have met you. It really is. You too. I mean, how hard and how mean yeah. does this guy have to be yeah. to be doing this road, you know? Nice to have met you, mate. Yeah, you too. Good luck. Yeah, good luck, yeah. mate. Good luck, mate. Yeah, cheers, mate. In this heat, really, really hard. And on your own. Russ Malkin, the producer of Long Way Down, actually ended up sponsoring Jason, giving him the final cash infusion he needed for the last leg of his journey home. Only one major obstacle sat in front of him. In six weeks, he still hadn't heard back on his Egyptian visa. With his non-extendable Sudanese visa, about to expire, he was forced to take drastic action. In the dark of night, he attempted an illegal border crossing into Egypt. He was unsuccessful. Never in his life had he imagined being held under the suspicion of espionage in an Egyptian prison. But that's exactly where he found himself. To his surprise, when officials arrived, Instead of charges, which is exactly what he expected, they delivered his long-awaited visa, wished him luck, and sent him on his way. He only had a little bit of distance to cover in his kayak, and then with his bicycle, he journeyed the rest of the way home. On October 6th, 2007, after 45,000 miles, 13 years, and the experience of many lifetimes, Jason Lewis became the first person to circumnavigate the globe using only human power. Skating, cycling, sea kayaking, and a custom-made paddle boat. And he traveled all the way around the world. He didn't do it alone. He had lots of support along the way. But if it wasn't for his sheer willpower, there's no way he would have completed the journey. So many countless times, all reason and logic told him to quit, yet he continued to persevere and accomplished something great. So next time you feel like people are just the worst, the worst, think about Jason and remember just how epic people can be. The one Our major cities and their corresponding industry are one of the largest sources of airborne pollutants worldwide. Just look at the smog covering these metropolitan areas. And this is outside. The air inside car tunnels is upwards of a thousand times more polluted. This smog has some serious negative health effects. So people are constantly looking for solutions to help clean the air. But what if the city's infrastructure itself could prevent the smog from being an issue in the first place? A team from the Korea Institute for Civil Engineering and Building Technology, KICT, built on prior research to develop a revolutionary photocatalytic concrete that works in conjunction with a coating of titanium dioxide to pull contaminants directly from the air. Activated by sunlight, it creates reactive oxygen species, or ROS. These ROS react with common pollutants, including nitrogen oxides and ammonia, to break them down into harmless salts. They first tried adding the titanium dioxide directly to the concrete, but found it compromised overall strength. So they tried applying it as an exterior coating and actually found that it improved overall compressive strength. So that's what they went with. The team tested it in a car tunnel with the help of artificial lights. And after only 24 hours, they measured an 18% overall reduction in airborne pollutants. The only byproduct 
the small pile of salt at the base of the wall that was easily washed away. They hoped to improve overall efficiency before sending it to market, but even in its current state, it could go a long way to improve air quality for everyone. The wonder... I'm sure you've heard about just how much more powerful your smartphone is compared to the computer on Apollo 11. That's absolutely true but I think it's putting it a little too mildly. The guidance computer on the Apollo 11 sported a whopping four kilobytes of RAM, only 32 kilobytes of memory storage, and weighed 70 kilograms, which is about 150 pounds. A current USB-C wall charger has eight kilobytes of RAM and 128 kilobytes of memory storage. Your basic wall charger has almost twice the computing power of Apollo 11. Of course, it's not that simple. You can't fly to the moon with a couple of wall chargers. But you get the idea. There's no doubt just how far we've come in terms of technological advancement. But I'm not sure that's 100% what we should focus on. Just think about how far we went with so little. With technology, most people will consider completely obsolete and useless today. Humans were able to fly all the way to the moon and back safely. The ingenuity behind the whole endeavor is just mind-boggling when you think about it. The wonder... Meet Elasmotherium. This gargantuan titan is nicknamed the Siberian Unicorn, and it's one of the Ice Age giants. It's nothing like the mythical horn-wielding horse, but much closer to a modern-day rhinoceros, just significantly bigger. This behemoth made its home across most of the Eurasian grasslands. Between the late Miocene, or about 10 million years ago, and the late Pleistocene, or about 39,000 years ago, at about three and a half tons, 15 feet long, and about eight foot at the shoulder, Professor Adrian of the London Natural History Museum called them a sort of prehistoric lawnmower. Their massive horn was made of keratin, so naturally it wouldn't leave a fossil behind. So scientists were able to analyze the skull as well as the vertebral column to come to the conclusion that the horn was over three meters, or almost 10 feet long. That's massive. For comparison, your standard full-sized pickup truck weighs about two and a half tons, is about 19 feet long, and is only about six and a half feet tall. Now slap a 10 foot horn on the hood, and you'll have a rough idea of the immense size of this arm and armored herbivore. It's almost hard to imagine. Nature really is epic. The wonder... Tattoos, one of the oldest known forms of art. The earliest examples were actually found on Atsi, the ice man, dating back almost 6,000 years. People use them to represent everything, from the oldest of traditions to pure and utter silliness. As beautiful and important as they can be, that's not always the case, and circumstances sometimes require them to be removed. The modern laser removal process is surprisingly cool and complex. But before we get to that, it's important to understand what makes tattoos permanent in the first place. Human beings replace all of their skin roughly every 30 days. So if the ink is only applied on the surface, that's about the longest it'll last. This is the concept behind henna tattoos. To get around this, the ink needs to be deposited into the dermis layer of the skin. Contrary to what you may think, it's not actually injected. The tattoo needles are covered in ink. Think paintbrush. And as they poke all the tiny holes in the skin down to the dermis, capillary action actually draws the ink down into the skin versus the ink being injected. 
With this placement, the ink is now substantially more permanent. However, just like any time you break the skin, your body's immune response is triggered. One part of this response is for the breach to be flooded with special white blood cells called macrophages. Think of them as big burly bouncers crossed with Pac-Man. Because instead of throwing out unruly customers, they eat them. This process is called phagocytosis. They basically extrude themselves and engulf the foreign objects. This is why tattoos are permanent, but also why tattoos fade. You can see the difference here between a brand new tattoo and a tattoo from 30 years ago. The ink particles are just too big for the white blood cells to eat in one bite, so they slowly eat away at them. Hence the fading. It's like a mouse trying to eat a house-sized wheel of cheese. Given enough time, the mouse will make a valiant effort, but could never eat the whole thing. Even a team of mice have no chance. Now we come to the removal process. This is where lasers come into play. We're popping popcorn with lasers. To put it simply, they break the ink particles up into smaller, bite-sized pieces, which our metaphorical mice have a much easier time with. But how is this accomplished with lasers, you ask? Science, that's how. Currently, the most widely used are ultra-short pulse lasers. They are unlike your typical laser pointer, which is a continuous beam of light. They pulse at a picosecond rate. That's a trillionth of a second. Using a precisely calibrated laser, different color inks require a different wavelength of light. One side of the ink particle is heated exponentially, approaching 300 degrees Celsius. The extreme temperature differential between the two sides of the ink particle cause the ink particle to shatter into a bunch of tiny pieces, facilitating your body's ability to process it and then dispose of it through your liver. This is done so quickly that only the ink particles are affected, leaving the surrounding tissue unharmed. This principle is called selective photothermolysis. The size, the age, and the color of the tattoo are the major determining factors for how many treatments will be required. The older and darker the tattoo, the easier it is to remove. Older, because the body's already started to eat away at it, and darker, because darker colors absorb more wavelengths of light. This process does have one minor short-term side effect. It's called frosting. It's the discoloration that you can see right after the laser pulse. As the ink particles shatter, CO2 is released, and it sends a kind of shock wave through the cellular membrane. Thankfully, it isn't harmful and dissipates very quickly. In the past, the risk for scarring, infection, and other complication was much higher. But recent advancements have greatly reduced the overall risk. Granted, you allow enough time for the skin to heal properly. If you get a really bad sunburn, and then immediately go back out into the sun the next day, you're probably gonna scar. Same concept. With rare exception, even the most modern and vibrant tattoos can be removed with very little risk, granting some a fresh start and others a fresh canvas. The reason for the tattoo removal is irrelevant, but the science is really cool. The wonder is out there. We just have to be looking for it.